The Center for Educational Media and the College of Education at Middle Tennessee State University are proud to offer professional development to K-12 educators in Tennessee through our online video library. The following video is presented by the Center for Educational Media in partnership with Professional Educators of Tennessee's Leader U Conference. For more professional development videos, check out our website at cem.mtsu.edu. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Now, I know it's been a long day, and you all have been sitting all day, and you're probably getting a little tired now, so I'm going to try my best not to bore you. Uh, I really do. I'm very passionate, though, about my topic, which is bridging gaps and cultivating student curiosity. Um, I received an email from Ms. Bethany. She saw this when I presented at, at Motocon. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to share with you some of the things I shared at, at Motocon, but a lot can change in a year's time. So. At the time that I did this presentation, I was teaching ELA and social studies, and as mentioned, I now teach STEM, which has given me even more opportunities to bridge gaps. So I'm going to share some of those things with you as well, and then we're going to look a little bit at Edmodo and what it does and how we can leverage the power of Edmodo to bridge gaps in our, our classrooms. So as she stated, I'm a PBS digital innovator, uh, EdmodoCon speaker, and I just love that picture on the far left. <laughs> A lot of energy, a lot of excitement in my classroom, and the, I try to bring a lot of energy into my classroom because the students are energetic, and I, I know that in order to keep up with them, in order to um, gel with them and bond with them, they look for that same kind of energy, so there it is. You have it. There it is. There's that energy there. I also, as stated, I recently received the Excellence in Teaching STEM Award at the Tennessee STEM Initiative Summit, Innovative Summit, and that was just last month, so that was very exciting. I, I wanna tell you a little bit about our school. I teach at Eastside Intermediate School in Haywood County in Brownsville, and we are a leader in me school. The leader in me is based on Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, and they put that program together for students. Just imagine how powerful it is if students can learn those things at a young age and those things carry with them throughout life. So at our school, we teach that every student is a leader. Um, you know, a lot of times, well, before the Leader in Me program and what we've seen in the past is that you have certain students that get to do certain things. But when you add the Leader in Me program, all students are leaders. You find that those strengths of every student in that school. And every student in that school is given some kind of responsibility and their, their leadership skills are developed. So with between the Leader and Me program in our school and having the STEM in the classroom, those two, two things combined together made for a very interesting and very exciting year in our classroom. So usually I start off by asking my students this question. Would you allow someone else to constantly drive your car if you were in high school? And you know high schoolers, they're just excited about getting their driver's license, getting that first car. And your parents brought you a brand new, shiny red car. Would you allow someone else, a friend, relative, to drive your car every day? And you know the answer is absolutely no. So then why would you depend on someone else to constantly drive your education for you? Students need to take some kind of responsibility for their education especially today when things have changed a lot as far as where students go uh, post-secondary because some students will go to a four-year college, some students will go to um, some kind of TCAT training or something like that, and some students will go right into a workforce. So now the concept and idea is not to tell them where to go, but to help them to prepare for where they want to go. So in order to do that, they need to have some kind of idea of what are, my passions? what are my passions? What's available to me? A lot of times we want students to tell us what they want to do and what they want to be, and they have no idea what's available. It's like if you go into a very fancy restaurant for the very first time, and they give you, uh, well, you know that the prices there are really high, you wouldn't just go and, and ask for certain things. You would want to see a menu. You want to see what they offer. You want to see the prices. You need to know all of these things to make good, informed decisions. Same thing with our children in education. In order for them to make good, informed decisions about their future, they need to know what their options are. 
And the only way for them to really find out what they're passionate about is to give them opportunities to explore different things and different ideas. And we want to start them as early as possible. Sometimes, you know, we wait until late middle school, high school, to get them to start thinking about certain things. But had they been exposed a little younger, maybe they could have already had the path set to be working toward these certain places. We want to begin, that's one of Stephen Covey's seven habits, we want to begin with the end in mind. So those are some of the things that I think about or we all should think about in our classroom when we're teaching. So who owns your learning? That's what students need to know. Students, parents, and teachers, it takes all of us really working together to set that path because we're all going to play a part or a role in getting students to their final destination. But students don't need to be left in the, in the dark about what's going on with me. How do I get there? Where am I going? They need to be able to answer all of those questions. And we need to provide what they need to be able to answer those questions. So in my technology enrichment, and I do fourth and fifth grade, so in my technology enrichment class, rather than having 20 students constantly asking me, how do I do this? They are required to ask peers who have already discovered how. And peers are to teach. I tell them, if you can explain to someone else, then that means you know it. And the more you explain it, the better it becomes ingrained in you. And very seldomly do I answer a question from a student in a classroom that another peer can answer for them. And I always tell them, there was always the rule, was to ask at least three before you ask me. And, and then I had to be, I had to even teach them to be selective in those three you ask. Because if I look around this room, everybody in here comes with different backgrounds, different gifts, different talents. Well, if I need to know a particular thing, I need to find that person who is knowledgeable in that area. And students need to be able to figure out which of my friends can help me with this. It's just like when you're going for professional help somewhere, you need to find out which organization is able to help you professionally. So it's the same thing in the classroom. So here you'll see, um, this is actually inside of Edmodo, some things that my students have worked on. I'm trying to think, we were doing uh, a social studies assignment. Now, with my technology enrichment class, they would come from different homerooms. So sometimes different people were in different places. So that means when they came to come to technology enrichment, they could actually be working on different things. But Edmodo also has a way for you to group certain students together so that this group, even though they're on separate computers, can work together on this project. And it was really good that way. So I see that we were in a social studies area, and some people were working on explorers. And they were doing the background research about the explorer. The thing that is great about Edmodo, and I'll mention these things, and then when we get closer to the end, and I'll really pull Edmodo up and start looking at it and how you get to all these things. But the thing about Edmodo is anything else you're using can be pulled in. So I can see that at the very bottom, they've gone to either Lucid Chart. Yeah, it's Lucid Chart. It says here on the bottom. They've gone to Lucid Chart to create a chart about the explorer that they were researching, and they put it in Edmodo. And that way, the whole class can see what's, what goes in here. And they can go back and comment on it. They can ask questions. They can make suggestions. So that was the thing that we used for collaboration. Here, we have a green screen in our room. And students were going to do presentations from their research about their uh, Explorer. So I told them, because at that time, because we were limited with technology, that they had to go and find their green screen picture. And then I would set it up for them. So someone had chosen the green screen picture that they wanted. They had put it in Edmodo so I could quickly go in and find it and have it set up for them when they got ready to do their presentation. And here are just a few comments from the students. Brian says, wow. Harrison says, nice. With fourth and fifth graders, it sometimes it's a struggle to get them to not just answer with one word. I say to them, please make a complete sentence, um, give productive feedback. And, and we're working on those things and progressing as we go. Those students who were making those comments are wow and nice where they were in my class technology enrichment last year as fourth graders. I saw a, a big difference in them this year as fifth graders. So we'll just keep working on it. So another activity we did is I had students to use the Google Earth app to find, we first started with them locating their homes, locating their homes, locating grandmother's home, because what I want to take them into is being able to locate important places and let's have some discussions about these places because what I found with them reading their social studies weekly 
sometimes students had a hard time understanding what was fact and what was fiction. Some names didn't register with them. They had never heard them before. They didn't make sense to them. They said, oh, that's not real. So this was an activity to help them to be able to locate places and see these places are really real. But we started with home. And you would be amazed because a lot of my fourth and fifth graders had no idea that this was possible. That I could find, oh, the, the conversations that went on. That's grandmama house. That's my grandma. Miss Clark. So we found the school and everything. And it's like, OK. So if, if we walk outside right now, will, will we be able to see ourselves moving outside? I said, hey, the best way to find out, let's do it. You know, I didn't, I'm like, I don't want you just to go running outside by yourself because some people may not come back in the building. <laughs> but we devised a plan and let's get outside while some people are still inside watching to see what goes on. Is this in real time? Or, you know, has this been recorded or what is this? So this, this opened up a lot of conversation with fourth and fifth graders. Now, let me say this. I really wanted them to always, when their conversations were opened, I wanted them to type their thoughts and ideas into Edmodo so that we would have that information there. But that was the hardest thing to get them to do. They would much rather blurt across the room to their friends. However, still me being able to hear that conversation and know that they're learning from one another, it was, I counted that a success as well. Oh yeah, I did want to share that there is one student who was having trouble getting his home pulled. I mean, you know how technology can be. It's great when it works and when it doesn't work. And so he just, he was getting very frustrated. He could not get his house pulled up. And so he did type into Edmodo, it will not show my house. Well, one of his very helpful friends said, well, probably because you don't know your address. <laughs> and that was not his problem, but you would also probably, well, maybe not be surprised how many fourth and fifth graders don't know their address. So this was another way of getting a, a learning experience because here was a deal. If you don't know your address today, if you want to see this house on Google Docs, you come back tomorrow and you know that address. And you better believe everybody who did not know that address, they came back the next day and they knew that address because they wanted to be a part of this. So using Edmodo, students learn to make connections, to use inquiry-based learning, and to distinguish fact from opinion. What you're looking at here is also from, some of it is from Google Map now. We know that map, there are all different types of maps. Students had to figure out why some maps will show you actual pictures and you can tell what you're looking at, satellite views. Some maps just give us lines. Some maps give us uh, more of the indentations or, of different things. And so this was a good opportunity for them to look and see that all of these are the same places. But they look different. Why do they look different? And could you tell if you were not looking at a good clear picture of something, could you still be able to tell that th these two things are the same places? So these were good. Uh, opportunities for them to figure those things out. The one, the picture on the very, uh, that's your right. On your right, I actually took while I was in Philadelphia for, for PBS, and I just had them, I think that place is called Zios, or I think it's pronounced Zios, Z-I-O. -Z I had them to go into Google Maps and find the location, find where Mrs. Clark was last summer. So that was, that was exciting for them because it made sense to them since their teacher had actually been to this place. <coughs> so here's a picture of the social studies weekly that they use. And there's a, also another picture that I took when I was in Philadelphia. The social studies weekly, and this is really what made me uh, really excited because a student who struggled in social studies always struggled to find those, questions, those answers in the weekly. She was trying to do, fill out her answers in her weekly, and, and she said, Ms. Clark, she says, wait a minute. She says, it says something about Benjamin Franklin being in Philadelphia. She said, didn't you go to Philadelphia last summer? I said, yes, I did go to Philadelphia. And she said, did you see um, the Liberty Bell? And I told her I saw the Liberty Bell, where the Lib Liberty Bell was housed, and, and she was just, just asking a number of questions, and I was glad to have her in that engaging conversation. And then she said, did you see Benjamin Franklin there? Like, oh! <laughs> so, like, okay, so we're making some progress. We still have some other things to learn. They struggle with time, but at least they can see the place. And let's figure out the time here. I also had them to look at from their Social Studies Weekly and the picture that I gave them. We talked about primary and secondary sources. 
And if you look at what was going on in your social studies weeklies in the 1700s, what would be the difference between what you would see then and what you would see modern day? And of course, they need to be able to pick out the fact that they had cars, you know, now we have the cars and we have the light bulbs and all those good things. We wouldn't, they wouldn't have seen those things in the 1700s. So all of those were just ways of us learning and using Edmodo in the process. And the thing about Edmodo is because once you put your thoughts and your ideas and your activities in there, they're there. You can go back and reference them. There's a backpack in Edmodo. Just like if students came with a backpack on their back and you said, put your journal, put your books, put your pencils in your backpack, Edmodo has an online backpack and they can put everything in their backpack. So no matter what computer they're on, where they go, once they log into their account, everything is still in their backpack. So here we were having our first uh, international multicultural fair. So when the technology enrichment students came to me, they had to research whatever country their class was responsible for. Every class was responsible for a different country. So if I had groups of people that came from one class and groups of people that came from another class and groups of people from another class, then they all could go in a little small group on Edmodo and they could do their research together. So you wouldn't have people coming up with the same information and when they put all their information together, it's like, oh, well, I was researching that. So it, it's all in Edmodo, they could decide amongst themselves who's going to do what. And I try my best to leave that responsibility up to them. You work it out. Don't, I don't want to be the one to assign, okay, this is what you're going to do. I want you to find that thing that you may be most interested in because that's the thing you're going to put your energy and your time into. So they did really well with that. Here's the power of collaboration. Um, I, I learned about Edmodo. This is my sixth year. I'll be going into my seventh year teaching. I learned about Edmodo right as I was going into teaching. And so as a new teacher, this was my way uh, with the reading assignments. I would put the reading assignments, the vocabulary words, and what have you in Edmodo, and they, they were there for the students. So this one instance I will never forget, I was up teaching my heart out. And I asked a question, and you know you really want every hand to pop up, but you know that's not reality. And everybody just kind of sat there and looked at me until finally one student raised her hand. And so I said, yes, somebody's going to, you know, answer the question. And she said, "Miss Clark, she says, I'm moving. She says, my family is moving. She was from another country, so they were moving either to California to be closer or to the other country. However it was, she was moving far away. And she was really sad about it. And the whole class, you could hear them, they just really got really quiet and really still. And everybody looked at me as if to say, Miss Clark, do something. And I'm thinking, you know, what can I do? But I hate to lose her. And then it dawned on me. I said, well, just remember, you can always stay connected to us on Edmodo. Because you have your username and your password. So, you know, you send us, send us information about what's going on with your life and let us know what's going on and we'll let you know what's happening in the classroom. And so we went on. It was kind of a sadness in the room because we, we, once you become a family, you know, you kind of hate for anybody to leave that family. And so... <clears throat> I'll never forget, I think we went on maybe spring break, some kind of break. And Edmodo has these little, a little bell that shows you your messages that need to be read. And so we were on break and a bell comes up and I'm thinking, who's putting anything on Edmodo over break? So I, I um, clicked on the little bell to see what the message was. And this is what the message said. Miss Clark, I'm coming home. And it just broke my heart. We were so happy to have her back. So. And let me say, before I go to the next steps, <clears throat> when she came home, she was gone for a little while. And so we had been through some reading lessons without her. So when she came back, ordinarily you have to catch them up and get them back on track and make sure that they are where you are. But this girl was ready because she had been keeping up with every assignment on Edmodo. She had been doing the work. So you know that is the power of, of Edmodo. So, Next steps, I want to say to you, limit the amount of information you provide to students. Foster curiosity by providing a hook and the basics they will need for success. Because what I want to say is when kids are kind of preschool, kindergarten, they ask a lot of questions. And you know, we as educators, we're trying to teach and you're asking all these questions. And we tell students, stop asking all of those questions so I can teach. And so you, time goes on and they get to the older grades and they're not asking questions. And we say, 
what's wrong with these kids today? They have no curiosity. They have no inquiry. They are not, they don't ask questions. They don't want to know. And I'm like, okay, you know why? Because we told them when they were younger to stop asking questions. I tell my students all the time, ask. Ask. And now I don't answer everything they ask, but it's not because I don't welcome the questions. It's because if you're curious about it, I need you to go and do some research and come back. And, and I know so many times they really want me just to answer the question, let's move on. But I try to flip it in a way that sometimes I offer incentives because I know you got to do something to get people to do what they need to do for themselves. But sometimes I offer some really nice incentives. If you'll go home and you'll find that thing out, or if there's time in class, if you'll work with your group and you can figure that thing out. And let me just tell you what happened just yesterday. I'm, right now I'm teaching a Summer Express class, and we have these robots, Dot and Dash, I know some of you may be familiar with them, are designed for students up to sixth grade, I think. And then there's Q. Q is for 11 and up. Q is a lot more advanced than Dot and Dash. Well, I had some boys, mind you, they're going to fifth grade. They were playing with Q. And we had a maze on the floor, and the, their goal was to program Q to get through the maze. They had been working on it, they had been working on it, and it wasn't working. And they came to me and they said, Ms. Clark, we don't understand this, this, and this. And I said, well, go Google it because I'm doing something. I wasn't too busy to help them. I just really needed them to go Google it. And I, need them to make, I didn't want them to feel like, well, she's not doing anything, but she just won't help us. So I'm like, I'm doing something that's going to help you guys for the lesson we're doing this afternoon, something, something. So they went on back. And so I'm busy working. And all of a sudden, I hear, Miss Clark, Miss Clark is going through the maze. It's going through the maze. And these boys had actually programmed, mind you, this was an older, this cue is for older kids, and it was a little more advanced than what they had been used to, but they had figured it out. And they were so proud of themselves, and I was so proud of them. So if you would leave children alone and let them have the time to work together, to research it, to figure it out, they can figure it out. I'll say this, we had we had our first STEM fair. And all year long, I've taught prototypes, I've taught the design process, I've taught this, I've taught this. End of the year, I want every team to create a project for the STEM fair. Well, I had a parent, kind of upset, because they called, they want to know, what's a prototype? How my child know about a prototype? You ask them too much of my child, I'm thinking, mm. But you don't know what this child has been doing in this classroom all year long. I'm thinking, just let this child alone, and they will figure this out. So I assured the parent that I've taught prototype, and I promise you, your child is very capable that they can get this done. And in the end, this child came up with something that was a very great project for the STEM fair. And this parent was very proud of this child. So I just. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that if we allow them, if, if we give them that opportunity, they can do the work. So I say allow them to do the fishing. Provide assignments that are authentic and engaging. Choose reliable, responsible students to be the leading innovators. And I say that with technology, there are some students that are just really into technology and they can figure out when your device is not working, they can figure out what needs to be done. Where it's just like we just had to have someone to come in and help me just a second ago. And I Consider myself a little tech savvy, but no one knows everything. I said it to my kids all the time. Don't be afraid of failing or don't be afraid of getting it wrong. No one knows everything. Find another peer in the room who can help you. Um, I think it was Maya Angelou said that, Maya Angelou says that when you know, teach. I think that's how it goes. That's my thing in the classroom. When you know something, don't keep that information to yourself. Share that information with your peers, especially now that we're in STEM. The big thing is everything that we innovate was created by someone else, and we're building on their ideas. And had someone not originally created this, we wouldn't have anything to build on. So share that information, because you never know when somebody's going to Here's something that will spark imagination or creativity that will be the next great thing for all of us. So I encourage them to um, do the research, do the work, share the findings. Do the research, do the work, share the findings. Do the research, do the work, share the findings. And make sure that what you're sharing is good, solid, um, factual information. Don't just throw stuff at people. 
So those students who are good with the technology, they can be your go-tos for students who need that extra assistance. But hardly ever, again, do I mess with anything in the classroom. When students need help, ask a peer. Now, if there is not a person in the room who can do it, by all means, I'm available to step in, but I have tried my best to give them the autonomy to be the best them that they can be and to continue to teach what they've learned so it, it can become ingrained in them. Just to share a few things that went on in our STEM classroom that helped cultivate curiosity and bridge those gaps is we had speakers with STEM careers to come in and speak. Statistics show that females very seldomly go into STEM jobs, but STEM jobs are some of the fastest growing, highest paying jobs there are and more ho households are being led by women, but women don't go into these careers that pay a lot. So the thing is, the consensus is, is you catch females while they're young. And that was the thing that sold me on teaching STEM because, yeah, the first time they put a robot in my hand, and he, it was a whole lot of little pieces, just little pieces, little nuts and bolts, and, and they say, here, put this robot together. And I'm thinking, you want me to put the robot together? Growing up, I played with dolls. I didn't play with trucks. I didn't put things together. So that was very intimidating for me. But I knew I had to get it done. So when I got it put together, how proud I was of myself. But that wasn't the only thing. We were putting them together for a competition. Well, I hadn't played with the remote control since my brother had Atari when we were small years and years ago. So that intimidated me because I'm competitive, and I only want to do something that I know there's a possibility that I can win. And I didn't think I could win because I hadn't done this in forever. So what I thought I would do, we were in a conference, and they had assigned each of us numbers. My number was seven. I thought when they got to number seven, number seven could say, well, um, I'll pass. Just let somebody else do it. I'm not interested in blah, blah, blah. And they said, no, everybody has to try. So I really appreciate that because those are my rules in my classroom. Everybody has to try. So I knew I had to try. We got on the competition field. We were doing VEX Robotics. And the way it's set up, you get certain points for certain things that you do, but there is a drop tray that if you hit the drop tray, you get 20 points, which is the most points you probably can get at one time. Well, I had a hard time making my robot pick up the rings and put them on the poles where you get five points here, 10 points here, but I could hit that drop tray. And I hit that drop tray every time. So when the scores were tallied up, guess who won the game? <laughs> so I say that to my girls when they say, I don't know how to do that. That's too hard. I understand that. But we have to try. I said, that's all I ask. I ask you to try. And if you, we use the design process for STEM, which teaches that there are no failures. There's always room for improvement. So once we try, we test it. If it doesn't work the way we expected it to work or the way we intended to work, then we improve it. So it's no big deal. So we, my class has really grown in leaps and bounds with that failure component taken out. There's no failures here. There's just room for improvement. If it didn't work, it's no problem. Nothing works for everybody the first time. You look at the people who've been very successful in life, they've had a lot, a lot of failures to get to where they are. So I just tell them, look, learn from it and let's move on, let's, let's improve it, let's just keep moving on. So um, I have a police officer who brought his drone to our classroom and he taught the students about careers that involve drones and he took them out the back door with his drone and they flew the drones and that was one of the most interesting and engaging lessons. But my boys that will fly drones, they can tell you not only can they fly the drone, take it apart, put it back together, but they can tell you what careers involved drones. So there's a lot of learning going on, a lot of hands-on, exciting. The young lady that's a speaker, uh, she has a very long title, so don't ask me to repeat it, but she's with Kellogg's in Jackson. So she talked about why as a young girl, how she fell in love with engineering and why she decided to go into this field. And she brought them all potato chips and drinks that were made at Kellogg's. So, you know, they're, they're not forgetting that. And some of the students who, you know, all of our boys want to be athletic, athletes, both for the most part, some of them are beginning to really change their minds and see that there are other things in life that we can do. So that's great as well. We do a lot of collaboration, hands-on activities. Everything in my STEM classroom is PBL. Everything is PBL. Um, they're only with me for 45 minutes, and they come once every, every seven days. So there's a struggle sometimes to get through some of the projects in that amount of time. What I'm going to look into with Edmodo is doing some flipped lessons. 
so that they can do some of the background at home and then come in ready to design. Because what I found is the people who could be behavior problems sometimes, they love the hands-on activities. Those days, they're not getting in any trouble. But one of the first things the people that are, can be behavior problems ask when they walk into the room, what are we making today? Because the first time that I say, well, we have to do the research first, I can see the look on their face. Oh, oh, I'm cutting up today. So I'm trying to get us to a point where there is a way for you to do your background. And if you don't have your background ready, there's no way to move to the, what, we make, what we're making today. So that will be a way to encourage them to get the work done. OK, so this was more of a sitting get, but I don't like to be the one to do all the talking. So I want you just to take a minute, please, and turn to a neighbor and just share out so far what you've gotten out of this and how you can incorporate some of this in your classroom. How could it help your students? Take about two minutes to do a little share out. OK, guys, let's come back together. And I'd like to hear from some of you. What were some of your thoughts and ideas about how you can use this in your classroom or how you can cultivate curiosity with some of these methods or ideas? Any volunteers? Or you need to be voluntold. <laughs> <laughs> What's interesting? What stands out with you? What sticks with you? Or do you do anything similar in your own classrooms? Is, do you get all the kids, or do they get, have to choose like with some electives? Do you get all the kids in your school? At STEM, with the STEM class, I do. Every student comes to me. We have about 450 students in all. Only we, we service all the fourth and fifth graders in Haywood County. Now, with the technology enrichment, the students who test high enough that they don't need to go to um, an enrichment, then they come to one of five places and they rotate about every nine weeks or something like that with the technology. Listen, uh, I'm, I'm in high school and part of uh, Starry College was uh, part of what we have since Jackson State has been here. But we're also trying to work on the TCAT, so we want more students to go to TCAT. But part of the issue is, like what you're trying to do, which is great, is it's got to start much younger. And so my whole you know, life growing up, you had to go to college. I mean, like, college or bus, right? Well, my brother has been very, very successful, and he has a tool and die degree and makes a lot more money than I do. Not that money is everything. But, but, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't get on too much, but like, how do we, like, in our schools across Tennessee, we had, we, everybody, everybody, a lot of people want to come to Tennessee because it's very centrally located, it's, you know, cheaper than a lot of places, you know, we got TV, I mean, we have all these things here, and we've got students that could do those jobs, but we still have parents at home who think it's either, you know, working in a dirty factory or a, or a thing, how do we, how do we get them to realize, like, you can go to these places, get clean, and make good money, and not have to have $100,000? OK, I'm glad, you, I'm glad you asked. I am glad you asked. That's a great question, because right now, one of the things that we are working tremendously on is parent education. We have to educate parents. That's why I said it has to be teamwork between the parent, the teacher, and the student, because even if you prepare students, if the parent is not on board, then they can deter the student to do something completely different. So parents are not, a lot of times they're not aware because you know how we do. We say, you know, back in the day we used to, but this is not that. Times have changed, but they don't know that if they're not exposed and involved in that. So I will say our, we have a new superintendent and he does a tremendous job of going into the churches, going into the community centers, he has parents to meet him where he can explain all of this. They're, they're explaining to the parents how to get the dual credit, how factories are different now. They, let, they look at the salary. Like you said, your brother is making a whole lot more because it's no longer everybody's going to Everybody's not going to college. So many of our students went to college, didn't stay there, stacked up a whole lot of debt, and then they came back, and a lot of them are not doing anything. So to deter that, parents are going to have to be made aware of re what's really going on. So it's going to be, a, even with STEM, and the parent calling me about how does my child know what a prototype is, we had STEM night. And on STEM night, 
we had the robots going, we had a whole lot of activities going on, and I heard parents ask so many times, and I couldn't just sit down and talk with each one of them. I was back and forth throughout the building trying to make sure everything was flowing smoothly, but the parents, number one question they were asking, so what is this? Are they just playing all day? <laughs> so they have no idea. So it's, it's gonna be a responsibility for us to educate parents. Now, I was asked to do Edmodo, I've been using Edmodo for about five years, and when this school year started and I started STEM, I could not get Edmodo to work in my building. And it, I don't think it had anything to do with Edmodo itself because my laptop, my teacher laptop would work, but none of the student computers would pull up Edmodo. So I had to go to Plan B, and I used what's called Seesaw. And in Seesaw, all the work that the students did it went right into Seesaw, but now both Seesaw and Edmodo will do this. Both of them have a parent component that you send parents with, uh, Ed, with uh, Seesaw, I send a QR code to parents. With Edmodo, I sent a number code to parents. And parents can use those codes to have access to what their kids are doing in the classroom. Now, not a whole lot of parents did that. But that goes back to, I'm going to focus a lot this year on getting that knowledge out to those parents because I think that's going to make a huge difference. Parents just don't understand what's going on. And so we're going to have to educate them in order for them to be the support for their children. We've got a lot of work to do. And, and, and I'll be done with us as well, as, as principals and teachers as well. Um, one of our partners is 12. And so we went to in Jackson, it was neat. And then they, they took us to um, about 20, 30 kids to um, Mississippi, Atlanta, Mississippi, North Mississippi. Mm -hmm. Two million square feet. It was like a town in there. Clean. Um, I mean, and, and, and like, I mean, there were so many robotics. And I mean, just the different jobs that like, I, I, I didn't realize. I mean, I passed class all the time, but I, I, I didn't realize. I, I mean, I know they're, they're not like, you know, the steel plants you see in Pittsburgh, you know, the old movies. But I didn't, I didn't realize what some of these places have going on in the, you know, all the different, uh, different jobs that are available. So, listening to you say you didn't realize it, which I'm sure the majority of us don't really realize it. We become teachers, we're in the classroom all day. We don't really go out there a lot to really see what's in these places. And we're trying to do better about that as well. I request that we, in, in Brownsville, we have what's called a Haywood Leadership. And the people in that group, they go to all the different industries and see what's going on in there and learn what they're doing. They go into the schools and see what's going on in there and learn what's going on. So a lot of times I think the, there's a disconnect because we tell students, we want them to, well, we used to tell students, get you a job and go away from here. Go do something with your life. Go see the world, which there's nothing wrong with going to see the world, but you need economy boost in your community. If all the kids leave, I mean, and I did, I literally, I sat through a training once where a man showed us a video of where the majority of the young people, they, after they graduated, they were out of there. And you saw factories begin to close down and you saw schools begin to be boarded up. And once all that happened, that was it for that town. So we've got to prepare our students to be able to boost the economy. We want them to have really great jobs. And factories are not what they used to be. Uh, at all. I, as a very young woman coming out of college, well, I know I was still in college. I tried to work a factory job part-time, and it messed with my sinus and stuff so bad, the dust and things that were in there, but you don't see that now. Factories are, they're clean, they're quiet, and they pay really good money for some skills that you can get from a TCAT without building up a whole lot of debt and what have you. So as you say that, I want to say this too. Another thing about catching children young, because a lot of um, employers say that our children can't pass drug tests. They don't know how to communicate. They don't know how to collaborate. So in STEM, we work on all of those soft skills. So it's not so much about, it's not all about that grade that you're making, but can you communicate with your neighbor? Can you all, and when we look at, a lot of times we do what's called STEM challenges. I think I have some up there. We do STEM challenges. You know we only have 45 minutes. That's a time constraint. You know we only have 45 minutes. If you spend a large portion of that time arguing with your neighbor about how we're gonna do this or being upset because you didn't do it the way I wanted you to, in the end, 
when you look around to see which teams were successful and which ones were not, you see that the successful teams were the teams that could work together and they could get it done. Some children had to put aside their differences to get this to work. And at the very beginning of the school year, when they first came in and this was all new, it was rah, rah, rah. But you, as the year went on, I could hear those same people saying, man, we got to get together. We got to get moving because we only, man, we only got 30 minutes left. We got to, and I could see the difference. So behaviors learned. And so we want to model and teach the right behavior so that when they do get to high school, they have a plan and they know how to communicate and how to collaborate and we want them to be successful and we want the parents to be on board so yeah once again we've got a lot of work to there's a lot to be done there okay did i and i, I mean i didn't solve the world's problems <laughs> but i just it's gonna take us a while because this is fairly new most of our parents when we say the word stem i know when i say stem a lot of times the teachers in the building think i'm talking about the stem lab itself but STEM is something that really should be going on throughout the entire school. And when we ask professionals, even those working in STEM-related jobs, to come and talk about STEM, they'll come and they'll tell you about their job, but then they'll ask you, what is STEM? Because that's a new concept to a lot of people. And most parents have no idea what you're talking about when you say, my child is in STEM. So there's some educating to be done there. But we have got to bridge and gaps. We have definitely got to bridge those gaps. Get those females in there. We got the African-American males that hardly ever go into those um, careers. And I can see the difference in the classroom, even at the fourth and fifth grade level, because you've got some people who have been exposed to these things because that's what their parents do. So they come in, they get on board, and I try to make sure that they don't all get together in one group. I try to spread them out so that they can share what they're learning with other people in the group. But uh, we have a ways to go, but I believe it can be done, yes. You were getting ready to say. Yeah, um, I teach third grade ELA and social studies. And I used Google Earth this past year for my, and it's low income, big poverty school, lots of ELL students. So they've not seen the beach, they've not seen these things, and the social studies standards are geography related, travel the world. So I use Google Earth for them to be able to go visit these places and see the culture, because based on how the people were dressed, or and we compare. Well, how are they dressed versus how are we dressed? How are these kids look versus us? Just different things like that. And they always, Miss Smith, take us to the water. We want to see the water, you know, because they had never seen anything like that. So. And that's awesome because it used to be, we had to read a really good book to take us places that we may never go. And you have so many struggling readers who will never read that book. So now there are so many other ways. Um, virtual reality glasses are awesome. I did the Google cardboards and. So then when our country, when we did the multicultural fair, our country was, um, okay, Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. Israel, which they tell me Jerusalem is not the capital of Israel. But anyway, our country was Israel. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so when our visitors came in, we had Jerusalem in our Google Cardboard. And so that was an experience even for the parents that came in. Once again, guys, today, Today's world is different than the world that most parents grew up in. So there's a lot that they have not been exposed to. And so I guess it's going to, I know we say, well, we're educators, we teach children, but I guess in a way, we're going to have to educate adults as well if we're going to get them on board with, with, with what's going on. All right, any questions or comments? Just a really quick question. Is your um, county still saying STEM? Are they moving towards STEAM? Or moving towards STEAM, yes. Moving towards STEAM. Not STREAM, but moving towards STEAM. This year, my STEM lab will no longer be the STEM lab. It will be the STEAM lab. So, yes. Yes. And does everybody understand that STEM is science, technology, engineering, and math? If you add the A, you add the arts in. Now, one place added, uh, what'd you say? Reading. Reading. I was going to say one place added agriculture in for they, their aid because they were an agricultural community. And I've also heard, well, more private schools will add the religion in as the R. So there's a lot of different variations there. But we will become STEAM in the new school year, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. And, and my um, superintendent was very um, adamant that there are so many arts out there, and we don't want to look over those for those kids who are interested in those type of things. And that's what's important, making sure that we expose, him, expose children to as many things as we can expose them to, because 
we have no idea which direction a child will go if they have that exposure. And one of the uh, trainings I was in for Learning Blade, are you all familiar with Learning Blade? Learning Blade is free to all Tennessee educators, so write this down, Learning Blade. B-L-A-D-E, Learning Blade, free to all Tennessee educators. Designed more for middle school, but I use it with my little ones. Uh, it's all STEM related. It has missions in it. So students go in and they complete these missions. There's missions on things like uh, maybe like open heart surgery or dolphin, uh, underwater dolphin research or robotics. There's just different missions and there's a number of different ways you can do it. You can allow the students to go in and choose the mission that they're interested in or you can assign everybody the same missions. There are quizzes. That's where the middle school component come in with the quizzes. Those quizzes were a little above most of my students' head with the exception of my very high readers. But when I did a one-on-one -on -one with the people at Learning Blade, they said, Ms. Clark, if you won't be concerned about the score on the quizzes and just let them go through the missions, it'll be very beneficial for them. So that's exactly what we did. I had one student, he was good about melting down when he couldn't comprehend something, and I forgot to tell him that the quiz didn't matter. And I heard that meltdown coming, and I put my hand on him. I said, wait, wait, sweetheart. I said, not that serious. Let's not even worry about that quiz. Let's just get through the mission. After that, he did great, and he was really interested in the things that he was learning from the mission. So once again, Learning Blade, free for all Tennessee teachers, STEM missions that it take. Oh, and let me say this, the STEM missions are divided. They have a lot of different things that you have to go through to complete the mission, but it's divided into science, social studies, ELA, and math. So if you are, say, an ELA teacher, you don't have to go through the math and science and social studies part. You can just get through the ELA part. You can break it up any way you want to, but it's a great resource. Is it .com or just learning? It's .com. I think so. I think it's learningblade.com. I'm almost sure. Okay. Yes. Do you think that uh, this would help children, students, to be more interested in the area of reading and, and uh, you know, get, get better understanding of what, what it's all about, the adventures that they go through in this. Uh, okay, so she asked about if I think it will help students with reading. Let me say this. I mean, does it? Does it. That I can't, I don't know, I can't say it, but I will say this. We use technical text. Everything, I told you everything in my class is PBL, but there are instructions that come with everything, and I don't. At the very beginning of the year, I did to get them started. I would read the directions to them, but they had the directions there. And after I read it and asked any, answered any questions, if you needed to know something else, then you had to refer back to the text. But as the year went on, I started putting that technical text in their hand and says, here, you need to read this and you need to figure out how to make this work because we start with that example of how you get these toys, your parents give you these toys for Christmas mm -hmm. and you get ready to play with the toy that doesn't work. It was something your parents had to put together. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, so why do you think it didn't work? Because they didn't read the direction. You know, we want to look at, especially, I'm sorry to say this, but men, you know, they don't really want to read the direction. <laughs> they just want to put it. I'm sorry, but they, that's a, typically the men that I have worked with, they say, oh, I don't know how they go. And they start putting stuff together and they leave out a little something and then it doesn't work and we got to start all over. So I say to my kids, read the technical tech. That's what it's there for. So, okay. You're saying what? We don't need a direction. Okay. <laughs> I knew he said something. Okay. All right. And let me say this because I have twins who are 23 years old and they didn't have this when they were growing up. So my... And I also have a 21-year-old, but she's a computer science major, so she'll get some of this. But my daughter, who is a twin, who did not have this, every time she needs something put together, she calls and she says, Mama, where is Daddy? And I said, what do you want with him? Because I know what she's up to. She says, I need him to put this together for him. I said, no, I need you to put that together for yourself. I really want her to, and I know it's hard once you're an adult, and you hadn't been exposed to this, but I really want her to pull that technical text out and read that thing and put it together for herself. And the little boys that she, she's buying things for, I also want her to teach them, let them maybe help her. Because they're not, if it's not a surprise type thing, let them help you. Show them how to put these little pieces together. Start them while they're very young. We have the words and the pictures. 
And I'm glad you said that. She made a good point. If you had the words and the pictures, I'm going to show you. you there will be a picture of some bridges we put together at the beginning of the school year. Oh, my gosh. It took, it took the whole school to put them together. So when we got them done, it was awesome. But the pictures, you know how those pictures can be. Sometimes they have little arrows and little lines and different things on them. And some of the students just did not want to deal with that. But we were going to get that. I was adamant that we were going to get that thing done. And what happened is the more success they saw, the, the more we can get done, they, they can realize, oh, I can do that, the more confident they became. And so then when I put more things in front of them like that, they would jump on it where there was that intimidation at first. So, Oh, here's our bridges. You're talking about building bridges. These bridges we got, there is... And there's one in East Tennessee as well. These are from the West Tennessee STEM Hub. You can borrow things from them. And just check them out like you would check books out at the library. And that's where we got the bridges from. We borrowed the bridges. And those bridges are, you can see they're, the length of, they're quite long, because this is one of my fourth graders, and the bridge is almost as long as he is. So it really took us some work. And what I would do, I have four tables in my room, an S table, a T table, an E table, and an M table. So I put a different bridge on each table. When you come in, your team starts on the bridge. When the bell rings, I would say to them, just leave it like it is because the next class that comes in will pick up where you leave off. Because that's how it is in the, in the real world. In the real world, in a real company, no one team does it all. Different people do different aspects of it. It was the hardest thing at first when the bell would ring. They were so used to having to clean up behind them. It's funny because when you don't want them to clean up behind themselves, they leave a big mess. <laughs> When you do want them to clean up behind them, when you, what, what did I say, I said the back was when you want them to clean up behind themselves, they don't, they leave a big mess. When you don't want them to clean up, that's when they would clean up. The bell would ring and they start taking stuff apart. I said, no, no, don't take it apart. The next class that comes in is going to pick up where you left off. Now here's the deal. If the first group build the right, the solid foundation, then the next group has something to build on. But if the first group didn't put it together correctly, when the next group came in, they had to take it apart and start to rebuild. So that's one reason it took us a long time to do it, but it was such a great learning experience. And from the people that say, I, don't, I just don't know how to do this, it's too hard, I can't, when they start seeing little successes and we start giving them, sometimes you just so happen to have a, a group of people at the table that have the I can't. So we would say, okay, but you know, look at what's happening over here and let's come over here and let's see how they're doing this. And, you know, their friends would say, okay, you, one of your problems is you're not turning it the right way or you're not twisting it the right way or the arrow goes, if the arrow goes this way, that means, you know. So when they got it, so you all, I just, the successes I saw this year, they were just, they were great. Just to tell you a little bit about EdmodoCon, Edmodo is located in California. It's a startup business. The, the um, offices that we see, well, the offices that I see in my community is when you go in the building, everybody has their own little office and you just go. Those startup business out in California, they have just a big open space. So when people come to work, they can either, they don't have offices. There's a lot of little, I guess you would call them cubicles, but not really like the ones we see on TV with the big, tall thing where you really can't see each other because you can see everybody once you walk in the room. They can either work at their desk if they want, or they can go work on a couch if they want, or they can pull up a mat and work on the floor if they want. They can work anywhere they want. They just got to get the job done. The place is full of uh, food. I mean, there's like closets of food, and you know, if you need a snack, you go get a snack and you get back to work. And you know, you people say, have always said, well, you know, people won't get their work done if they're just free to just roam all over the place. But these people are very successful at what they do. They have a passion for it, they have a love for it, they know what the mission and the vision is, and they get the work done. And my dream is to build my STEM lab like that because right now my STEM lab is still like a classroom. And there's great things going on there, but I like to get it to the point where it's just an open, just like a startup business. And you come in and the thing that you value, the thing that you want to work, in, work on, you come in and you work on that thing. I met um, Sal Khan from Khan Academy at Edmodo Khan and Richard Collada, who is the CEO of ISTE. So we just had a really great time with Edmodo Khan. Now, I told you that at the beginning of the school year, Edmodo did not work in my building. Edmodo has made a lot of changes this year. So they sent me a video, and I think I'm going to start with the video. Because you'll see some of the changes that they've made, but you'll also see what Edmodo is all about. So we're going to try to check out this video. 
Hello, and welcome to the Edmodo 2018 product update. Joseph and I will be sharing some of the latest developments and enhancements to help you get the most out of Edmodo. I'm Sandra McConnell, I've taught second through sixth grades, and I first started using Edmodo as a way to connect with other teachers. I then gained the confidence to use it with my students, now I'm an ambassador and Edmodo certified trainer, as well as a contractor with Edmodo. Hi, and I'm Joseph Young. I taught high school math from algebra to calculus, ranging between ninth and twelfth grade. I recently joined Edmodo as a teacher advocate. I'm really excited to share what we've been working on and improvements that will make a difference in your classroom. So what is Edmodo? Edmodo is a learning first network. We connect teachers with students to help them learn. We connect teachers with other teachers to help them learn how to teach better. We connect students and teachers with resources to increase learning outcomes. And we help administrators bring their schools and districts on Edmodo so teachers can focus on helping students learn. Our features and platform are built around learning and learning about learning. So let's get started. Edmodo is your classroom in the cloud. Edmodo is a safe digital classroom environment that you can use to expand learning beyond your walls. It puts communication tools in your hands to harness the power of social learning, and it is truly a global teacher resource network. Improvements have been made across the spectrum, from making copies of docs for each student, integrating with other classroom apps, messaging on a school, class, or district-wide basis, and continually adding resources to help save teachers time. Over the past year, Edmodo has made quite a few improvements to the classroom tools, allowing you to expand your reach with teaching. Changes involving group management, assignment attachments, and the teacher grading experience all help to save you time to be more efficient and effective. We'll go into some of the major changes in the slides that follow. Edmodo provides secure integration capabilities and including auto-rostering, class setup, password syncing, creating PLCs, and account merging all work together to make this feature a real time saver and team builder. Like many teachers, I used Edmodo primarily to create an online space for the students in my classes. It's even easier now to set up your schedule with the new features we've added to group management. You can drag and drop your classes and small groups to match your schedule. Try using group copy if you want to keep your previous posts, but with a new set of students. We've also made it easier for parents to join your classes by letting them join with the same group code that their children use. Not only is Edmodo a great place to securely communicate with your students and their parents in classes, it's also a great way to connect and communicate with colleagues and teachers near and far. Groups are my go-to for finding, sharing, and requesting resources from like-minded educators. With groups and classes, I can host discussions all in the same place. Edmodo is also really useful for classroom productivity. Have you ever had a lesson plan get derailed by a jam in the copy machine or because you ran out of paper? Edmodo's newest assignment update will make those headaches a thing of the past by making copies digitally for you. The next time you need to make copies, try attaching a Microsoft Office or Google Doc to an assignment in Edmodo. Select the Make Copies option in the menu that appears and send them off to your students. Your students will then receive a copy of the exact same file you attached, but it will be their own version to edit and submit for themselves. All they need to do is open the assignment and click on their file. This will either open up in Google Docs or Office Online, which is included for free with an Edmodo account. They can then fill in their work and will even put their name on the file for them so that everything is organized when it gets turned back into you. Every teacher knows that grading is one of the most time-consuming parts of the job, so we've organized all your students' work into the stacks that match your normal workflow. The first tab collects all the work that's been submitted and ready to grade so that you can get started right away. Next, you'll see all the students who haven't turned in their work with read receipts so that you can follow up with who hasn't even started yet. Finally, you can see all the graded work as well as an all students view for once you're finished with grading. We have one last update to share that will really help improve your grading experience. If you send a Microsoft Office attachment, or better yet, use Make Copies with an Office file, you can use our new grading sidebar to quickly grade all your students' work. Simply open one of your students' files from your grading overview, and you'll be able to see their work while adding your grades and feedback on the right side of the page. Once you're done, click Next Student, and we'll automatically load the next piece of work without having to switch back to any other window. 
you can quickly grade an entire stack of submissions without any annoying breaks in your workflow. As Joseph said, we've made grading even easier. I love being able to grade without bringing home a big stack of papers. And now, with new grading periods, it's super easy to organize your digital gradebook. Previous period grades are saved, and new assignments and quizzes go directly into the new period. All periods are easily exported for your convenience. The next group of changes are all about our enhanced communication tools, where you can harness the power of social learning. With Edmodo's new communication capabilities, it's easier to send messages to everyone involved in a student's education. Edmodo helps you save time and focus your energies on teaching with these tools. The new Edmodo apps on iOS and Android are really something everyone needs to see. The entire interface has been streamlined to make it easier to find what you're looking for and keep all the parts of Edmodo in their own spaces. In the home stream, you can digest an overview of content that's related to you. Since your classes are a sacred space for you and your students, they get their own tab as well so that you can easily see them at a glance. Communication is such a big part of what teachers do on Edmodo, so we've built a fantastic messaging tool to make it even easier to have conversation with your students. You'll find all kinds of improvements to the mobile apps, so be sure to give it a try. You asked and Edmodo listened. We are excited to announce Markdown, which is rich text formatting. You can bold, italicize, and even add lists to your posts, allowing for clearer communication. These features will really help your post get the attention it deserves. With our redesigned home screen, you can share a note with all of your connections or your school. To send a message to your class or group, click on the class or group to send all post types. And you can still add another group to a post once you are in one of your groups. We've also heard overwhelming feedback about organizing direct messages so that they don't get lost in the stream. So we've created a dedicated space called Messages that you can access from the top navigation bar. We've seen that this form of messaging is extremely comfortable for students, so we hope you see an improvement in how you communicate with your students. And don't worry, students still can't send messages to each other, only to their teachers. If you prefer, you can create a group conversation with multiple students in case your students are working in pairs or in groups. Not only is Messages available for students and teachers, you can now use it to communicate with your students' parents as well. Since it's easier for parents to join your classes, you can use Messages to send or receive real-time updates when a student misses class or requires a parent notification. You don't have to give out your cell phone number to stay in touch anymore. Parents and teachers can also stay updated with school announcements, which Sandra will talk about next. School Pages are the new school and district branded pages powered by Edmodo that will allow all teachers, students, and parents to access mission critical information, events, updates, and resources from their school and district administrators. School and district administrators can send messages, share events and pictures, and even post polls. This is a great feature for district, school, and community-wide announcements and alerts. And finally, Edmodo is your global teacher resource network. You don't have to teach in a vacuum. Get the help and support you need for your classroom, find resources, and discuss with other teachers to discover how to reach each student. When I first started using Edmodo, it was for the sole purpose of connecting with other educators. I found great value in finding like-minded educators, whether across the city or across the globe, who could share resources with me, answer questions, and even offer support. Edmodo even helps me save time with collecting and curating resources, including lesson plans, activities, and quizzes. We know how hard it can be to find the right hook for a lesson or to search for new resources to engage your students. We created a tool to help you do just that. Since millions of video links have been shared on Edmodo, we've brought the best ones to you. Ask Mo has filtered the most popular educational video content and made it easy to search, find, and explore. Visit askmo.edmodo.com and search by grade level, category, or subject. Once you find something worth sharing, send it to your students and watch them engage like they never have before. Spotlight is Edmodo's own place for you to find, create, and share peer curated resources to help supplement your teaching materials. From algebra to zoology, primary teaching tools to professional development, 
Art Projects to Videos, you can find it in Spotlight. To find Spotlight, click on the down arrow by your name in Edmodo in the toolbar. There you will find hundreds of thousands of resources searchable by grade level, content area, and resource type. We have Spotlight resources available in over 10 languages with more coming soon, and the majority of our resources are free and open. Coming soon are new quizzes from Quizzes. Integrated into our Edmodo search, you can access a vast bank of engaging quizzes and even create your own. You can assign these quizzes in Edmodo and the grades will be included in your Edmodo gradebook. We're excited to share that we've created the first ever Chrome extension for Edmodo. This browser add-on allows you to collect your favorite websites and easily post them in your classes or add them to your library. Simply visit the Chrome Web Store and search Edmodo, or you can check the resource links in the description of this presentation. My students loved creating their own avatars and personalizing their Edmodo experience. With a few clicks, your students can design their own avatar, engaging them even more with Edmodo. Now that you've heard about our exciting new features, we hope you'll give them a try and let us know what you think. And we hope you'll join the conversation at the topic link provided. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay, so Edmodo has a lot to offer. One thing they didn't talk about that the kids really love, they have badges. So when kids do certain things, for instance, I think when I first started with, at the beginning of the year, when we would do Edmodo, I wanted, of course, parents to sign up so that they could be informed and involved in what their children were doing. So there was a parent badge that you could give the students if they were the first ones to have their parents sign up. So you had a lot of students that would run home because they were after that badge. And I don't know about you all, but I like collecting badges as well. So Edmodo gives teacher badges as well for some of the things that teachers do. But this is a very powerful um, platform. Somebody was talking earlier, I think Dr. Woodard mentioned something about social media and how connected children are today to social media. <clears throat> this was my student's Facebook because it was safe and it was secure. And the only people that could see what was going on were the people that were in our class with that code. So the only way that anybody else can see what's being said back and forth in your classroom is if you give them that code. So it made it safe for them to be able to communicate with one another, share their ideas or what have you. And, and it was their Facebook. I had to, I, I figured out that I had to give them a, le a little leeway to be silly some because once again, that was their way of socializing online. But you can set it up where you can either monitor the comments before they're posted. I really didn't want to have to do that because I wanted it to be immediate feedback. But then it depends on the class that you're dealing with. If you have students that are still a little immature in that area, then you may have to set it where you will be able to view um, what they're posting before you release it to be posted. But it, that works either way. Once again, anything you use, because I've used things like Buncee, um, Seesaw, Storybird, a number of other things we, that were outside of Edmodo, but I was able to pull them in. So whatever assignment I wanted them to do, if, if it required them going out to another link, I was able just to post that link in the assignments and they could just follow that link on out, do the work, and, and then share out in Edmodo what they had done. And I try to tell my students, guys, I'm preparing you for your future. And so let's look at this from, I want you to know what it looks like from a college standpoint or a college, college perspective, because online college courses is usually have you to do some work, then to view your peers' work and to make some uh, valuable comments on your peer work. So we did a lot of that type of thing. And they loved it. it, it they loved it as uh, compared to me standing in front of the class and walking you through things and blah, blah, blah. This was a way that they felt that they were ind independently being able to be successful on their own with little um, interference from the teacher. All right, any questions you have about Edmodo? Anybody here ever used Edmodo before today? Okay. So try it out. It's very valuable and pl plus the part of connecting with other teachers. Okay, so as a PBS digital innovator, PBS has an Edmodo uh, group. And so when they have different information they want to give out to us or something's new or some videos that we can use, I can just go to that group and get it. 
or there's other groups. Yeah, I said I had a green screen in my room. When I first got the green screen, I didn't have, I didn't know, I knew kind of how it worked, but I needed the ideas and I needed the ideas for my grade level and what have you. So there was a green screen group. There is a, just about a group for everything that you could think of in Edmodo. So I found, you know, some of those groups. And so when they're sharing out, I'm seeing the information that they're sharing out. And I think it's also valuable for us to share out as well. When we're doing something interesting in the classroom that I think would benefit other teachers, then I try to share that information out as well. But Edmodo is a, a very great tool. Um, I have students that have gone on to the middle school, and sometimes when I see them, they say, Ms. Clark, you still using Edmodo? You still got my username and password? Because that's the thing about them. With their username and password, even when they're gone on to the next school, they can still put things in Edmodo. They can still communicate back to you. So it's been a very valuable tool. And that may, when they say, are you still using Edmodo? That says to me, that's something that they really enjoy doing. That's something that they felt that it, they had fun with it. It was excitement while they were learning. Videos that you want them to see in the uh, technology lab, I had them to bring headphones because different people would be working at different times on different things, but there were videos I needed them to watch that showed them how to do the next assignment that they need to do. So they brought headphones and they were able to listen to the videos on Edmodo. If they wanted to keep the videos, it went right to their um, backpack. And also the thing with the avatar, because we talk about safety online and we talk about not putting information out there that your personal information out there because of all the things that's going on in the world today. So the avatars are set up where they can create an avatar. It's not them per se, but they can make it look as close to them as possible. Now they can put uh, a picture in all my school computers, of course, there's no picture of them. So that's something that they would have to go home and do and their parents have to be okay with that. Parents do have to sign a form saying that they give their child permission to be on Edmodo and, and being involved in these activities. All right, any other questions, comments? All right, if not, we're coming very close to a close. I do want you to share out again. So you watched the Edmo Edmodo video. So now I want you to take a little time and talk, have a conversation with your neighbor and talk about how this would be valuable in your setting. And you guys, and I especially like to hear from different age groups. I do elementary, but Edmodo can be used for all age levels. So you guys talk about for a little bit, how would this benefit you? And I, I really want, since, since we're talking about parents, I know it's harder to reach parents when you're in high school because those kids have, are pretty much adults now. We were talking earlier, there was a kindergarten teacher. She had one idea and there was a high school teacher on my other side. He had a different idea. And I said, you know the difference between you guys? It's the age you teach because kindergarten parents are going to be very involved. But by the time you get to high school, not that some high school parents are not involved, but those students are becoming independent. They're making their own decisions. And so sometimes it's much harder to get them that way. So just kind of have a conversation maybe about how could this possibly help with reaching parents and could this work for you all? Y'all talk. All right, guys, let's come back together and let's hear, let's share out some ideas. How do you think this will work or do you think this will work in your setting? Anybody? Or is it something you think you would use? I, when I was an instruction coach, I used to, to use the first teachers to use because they had so many resources. You're connected with people in so many different places. Yes. Sometimes we become kind of isolated to our area. So yeah, it's good. Yeah, I, it, it's definitely, there's some updated things on there that I don't know as much about. But. Well, and I feel the same, but I looked at the updates and I thought they were really great. Now, one thing they're doing away with, guys, they used to have where you could, you could choose the standards and the grade, and they would give you assessments for those standards. And then you could go and see what students are not um, re at benchmark for those standards, and they would offer um, support for those students to practice on, but they're doing away with that portion of and that was one of my favorite portions but they are saying that they will continue to offer resources so that if you are needing resources for certain standards or what have you then those are available in Edmodo as well. I saw another hand or somebody's getting ready to say something about Edmodo. Oh and let me just say this the thing that worked for me is that my fourth and fifth graders don't have emails 
And there are so many things that I've wanted to sign up for, but the students had to have individual emails. And we don't have Clever or we're, we don't use the Google Classroom. So Edmodo was perfect for them because they could set up, and I let them set up their own username and passwords. I think now is the time to learn how to do that because the thing about, you know the thing about a username and password, if you don't put it in the correct way, you can't get back into your account. And so usually when we're testing and what have you, there's no time to have kids to set up their own accounts. They're already pre-set up for them. So with this, I have them to set up their own accounts. We have these conversations about your responsibility with your password, because if you leave it open and someone comes in and they make some remarks that are inappropriate, whose responsibility is it? Where does the responsibility lie? I think they need to learn these things at a young age. I used to work in a library. And I cannot tell you how many adults came in and did online banking at the library. And when they were done, they just simply got up and walked off and left the thing wide open. And I would say to my students, if I was dishonest, I could probably have a lot of money by now out of some people's account. So there is a responsi huge responsibility with social media. And the biggest thing that I've said to them, do not put things on social media that's inappropriate thinking, oh, I'm just going to take it right back off. Because once it's out there, it's out there. And, uh, I think the, long, the sooner they learn that, the better off they are. All right, any other questions or comments? If not, I have, oh, 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 two things. For those of you saying that's a lot of information, I'll never figure out how to do all this, Edmodo has a help center that is awesome. You will, you go to the help center, you type in anything you need to know, like this, I typed, well, this one is about how to create and send a new quiz. It goes through all the steps, step by step, and then it has those visuals at the bottom that points to all the different parts, making it very easy for you. And the last thing that I want to share with you, that if you are interested, you can Google at MotoCon 2017 Sharon Clark, and you can listen to my presentation. I guess you said, who wants to hear your presentation all over again? <laughs> but no, you can listen to my presentation or others, because uh, Salman Khan did his presentation. Um, CEO, it's the CEO, Richard Collada did his presentation. And there were people from all over this country. That was, that's what was great about that aspect. People came from all over the country to speak that day. So to meet other educators in other countries that do things a little differently than we do here. So this happens each year around about the end of May, May-ish, they start searching for people. So if that's anybody's cup of tea, Look for them around about that time to apply to speak at Emoticons. They're always looking for speakers. They're always looking for educators to share what they know. All right. If nothing else, you all have been wonderful. I thank you all for coming. And you all have a wonderful summer. Thank you. Thank you.